Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Today, this lecture is about the pediatrics neurology. And to tell you, to give you the overview, of course, like uh, uh, we have done neurology and we have done, for example, headache. So headache, it's same. Either it will come in neurology, uh, pediatrics, or either it will come in adults. Um, they have the, like the same headaches. They do have migraine. They do have tension headache. They do have cluster headaches. Uh, they do have the same secondary causes of headache so uh, all of the things are remain same so that's why I'm not going to discuss them because uh, you already had the lectures off um, uh, you can say neurology you can go through them um, now we had done epilepsy as well in uh, uh, neurology uh, which is present like in my neurology playlist so in this one, like, of course, uh, when we will discuss, for example, seizures, so I will be stressing more on uh, uh, causes of seizure, seizures, which are typical to pediatrics, like febrile seizures, for example. So let's start, and uh, I would like to start with the, the topic of seizures. And uh, now seizure, which uh, uh, I already explained in neurology in good details, uh, as you know, like the seizures, they occur due to um, abnormal or excessive neuronal discharge. And uh, uh, simply the, the patients, you know, they go into um, what you can say, some jerky movements or it could be absent seizures or anything like this. Uh, so uh, uh, to start with, uh, whenever there is seizures, you know, um, there could be um, some of the causes for that. So I would like to include this one over here. So you can see like here. Um, there could be epilepsy. There could be non-epileptic seizures, right? So you can see um, in this case, uh, uh, when we are discussing epilepsies, you can see like number one here, epileptic, idiopathic, um, which are the common one right 70 80 percent cause unknown but presumed genetics so of course like these are those uh, which we have discussed in neurology like you will found the family history and all this stuff then there could be secondary causes like secondary to cerebral dysgenesis cerebral vascular occlusion cerebral damage like hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy uh, okay from this I, I i remind like you know one of the neurological topic is cerebral palsy as well which you have which i've already covered in the previous lectures of pediatrics. There could be tumors, there could be neurodegenerative disorders, and there could be neurocutaneous syndromes. I will talk about them in, at the end of the lecture. Like in this lecture, I'm talk about, I'll talk about that. Whereas when, when it is non-epileptic causes, so you can see febrile seizures we are going to discuss, metabolic causes like hypo, hyperglycemia, hypo, hypernatremia, hypo, hypercalcemia, I remember any electrolyte uh, abnormality can give seizures, head trauma, meningitis, encephalitis, poisons, and toxins, or you can say the secondary causes, right? So, uh, now, uh, uh, before going into the, to, uh, towards the details of what you can say, uh, the febrile seizures, rather, I, will, I would like to show you um, some of the uh, seizure disorders okay or you can say childhood epilepsy syndromes so first of all I will talk about that then I will talk about the febrile seizures um, now uh, to start with I wanted to show you something from uh, from here uh, okay again I don't think so I have to explain this thing but rather I am just including this thing over here right because all the things are already discussed in neurology, right? So you can go in the neurology playlist for those who don't know, like I am basically teaching a specific class over here. And for my students, you know, they know like what I'm talking about, like neurology playlist, you will found that. So generalized seizures, as you know, uh, which is like the origin is generalized from the both cerebral, cerebral cortex and it could be absent, it could be myoclonic, in which like there is a jerky movements in the limbs. 
in absence one of course there is a transient loss of consciousness tonic seizures in which the tone is increased and tonic clonic in which like there are the tone is increased and it is followed by rhythmic movements and there could be atonic seizures in which like there is suddenly loss of the tone of the body uh, whereas the second one is uh, for sure like uh, The focal seizures right so uh, like of course like these are those uh, which in which like just a small number of group of what you can say the neurons are firing it could be frontal temporal occipital or parietal like so simply uh, depending on which lobe is over firing so we can have the symptoms and signs of that for example a temporal lobe is the one where you will found uh, the areas or the auditory area or smell area so maybe like the person have the features related to that. Occipital are those where there is vision area. So related to that. So simply depending on what area is firing, we will have any features of that. So we call it as focal seizures, right? Um, now to talk about the childhood epileptic syndrome, guys. Uh, basically, um, the first thing I wanted to show you is... Uh, uh, it's related to the age or they are arranged to the according to the age group right uh, you can see like this one the first one is called as West syndrome okay first of all to tell you the importance guys uh, because I don't want to waste your energies on something which is not that much important so uh, this childhood epileptic syndromes are not so important that you know you will go and start memorizing each and everything no Febrile seizures is important. Absent seizures is important, right? So you can see like uh, uh, West syndrome, which occurs in four to six months of age. Okay, and if you will see like, you know, what is the pattern of the seizures that there is a, a flexor spasm of the head, trunk and the limbs followed by extension of the arm. So so-called salam spasms, okay? So uh, now, uh, this is how this thing occurs and they last for one to two seconds but they can come in multiple bursts right so uh, it can be misinterpreted as colic okay uh, now guys see uh, basically um, this one uh, which is which is written over here as West syndrome okay there is something called as infantile spasms, okay? So, infant, infantile spasms, they basically appear as, a, you can say, brief, repeated contractions of the neck, trunk, or extremities, okay? And they are associated with developmental delay, like the, peep, the babies who have infantile spasms, um, uh, what happens like... Uh, uh, they do have, uh, you can say, later on developmental delay, right? Okay, so the babies, when they have infantile spasms, okay, later on, they can de develop West syndrome or Lenox Gestalt syndrome, okay? So what I'm saying is simply there are babies who have infantile spasms okay so what are these again they are brief repeated symmetric contractions of the neck trunk or extremities right and they occur around at the same age when the vestidrome occur okay and 20 20 20 percent of the time you know there is no known cause but more most of the time they are secondary to due to metabolic or encephalopathies and things like this right so the, the babies who have infantile spasms, they may develop West syndrome or Lenox Gestalt syndrome. So <clears throat> see the comments, you know, may cause two thirds have underlying neurological cause. The EEG shows hips arrhythmia. What is hips arrhythmia? This is basically um, high voltage slow waves with spikes and poly spikes. 
a disorganized type of things okay so you see a chaotic pattern okay so there's a disorganized pattern of high voltage slow waves multi multi focal sharp wave discharges okay and the treatment is uh, we could give them the vigabatrin or corticosteroids um, we can also give them ACTH okay uh, now what is Lenox Castrot syndrome basically this is characterized by a triad of multiple seizure type okay uh, tonic seizures okay so Lenox Castrot syndrome is basically a triad of multiple seizure types with cognitive dysfunction okay and slow it's not written over here but there is slow generalized spike and slow waves on EEG so it is a triad of these three things okay multiple seizure types with diffuse cognitive dysfunction with slow generalized spike and slow wave EEG so the onset is around one to three years of age okay and most of these they have underlying brain malformations the management is simply we give them anti-epileptic drugs like well proic acid benzodiazepines and all those things okay other than that guys uh, uh, like other epileptic syndromes um, one of the things which I wanted to talk about and which is very 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 important is uh, absent seizures very 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 important right this one is important so childhood absent seizures uh, they are quite common they are quite important okay uh, you can see over here the onset care could be like in this age group but uh, these are the children who stare momentarily and they stop moving sometimes they do twist their eyelids and hand minimally last only a few seconds and certainly they are not more than 30 seconds right they are always less than 30 seconds and child they have no recall okay and they miss something and they may look puzzled or say pardon on regaining consciousness right it is more common in females than males so two-thirds are females see account for only two percent of the childhood epilepsy so not so important but remember they have a typical EEG pattern what happens is they show three hertz or three per second or three hertz spike and wave pattern okay and the drug which is very much used for these kind of uh, seizures or absence of epilepsy is etosuximide okay etosuximide a very important MCQ question as well uh, then you can see benign epilepsy with um, centrotemporal spikes bets okay so uh, benign focal epilepsy or with central temporal uh, spikes so this is tonic chronic seizure in sleep or simple focal seizures with awareness or abnormal feelings in the tongue and distortion of the face supplied by rolandic area of the brain that's why it is also called as benign focal epilepsy or childhood with rolandic okay because of rolandic area so you can see like this comprises around 15% of childhood epilepsies okay and uh, they have a typical EEG of sh focal sharp waves from the Rolandic or central temporal areas and the management is uh, we give them carbamazepine okay if the seizures are too much okay now one more slide I wanted to show you is uh, one thing is this one juvenile myoclonic epilepsy and one thing is early onset benign childhood or septal epilepsy uh, you can see over here younger children periods of unresponsive and eye deviation vomiting and autonomic features are there right 
So remember there is eye deviation and remember there is occipital, it is also called as an occipital epilepsy. So uh, this is very uncommon and EEG shows occipital discharges. Juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, it is also called as Jan syndrome, J-A-N-Z, Jan syndrome. So remember from myoclonus, these are myoclonic seizures, okay, but they can become generalized tonic-clonic seizures, okay. So a typical history is throwing drinks or cornflakes about in the morning as myoclonus occurs at these times and learning is impaired, okay. So it occurs in adolescence and uh, there is a characteristic EEG as well. It is like 3 to 3 of 3.5 to 6 hertz irregular uh, spike and wave okay and how we treat uh, lifelong treatment is needed for these patients okay and the treatment you know the prognosis of this condition is very 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 good Jan syndrome the prognosis is excellent but with lifelong treatment we give them well proic acid for the rest of the life. Excellent prognosis, but for treatment, okay? So remember guys, whenever we diagnose any patient with epileptic syndrome, we educate the kids, we educate the parents, we educate their school, their teachers, we tell them, don't leave them near the swimming pool, no bathing alone and stuff like this, right? We start them on drugs, depending on what kind of drug, like Valproic, Carbamazepine, or Ethosuximide, and uh, what you can say. Uh, sometimes we put them on ketogenic diet, which is a high-fat diet. Uh, like uh, many children, they respond to that, especially in Lenox Custard syndrome. You know, ketogenic diet goes, shows good results. Okay. Uh, so the same and uh, just education is like awareness, creating awareness is very important. Educating them is very, very, very important. So uh, one of the things which I chose, uh, like which is important one in this one to discuss is called as febrile seizures. And febrile seizures, as you know, like uh, uh, febrile seizures now. Now, febrile seizures, as you can see over here, they affect around 3% uh, of the children and have a genetic predisposition as well. Occur between 6 months and 6 years of age are usually brief, generalized tonic chronic seizures occurring with a rapid rise in fever. Okay. Okay, guys, I will tell you a few points about febrile seizures. Okay. A uh, few important points. And uh, when you will see this one first of all these are the most common seizures in children okay most oh sorry i don't know what's wrong with this but let me fix this so these are the most common seizures in childhood Uh, they occur more in male than females, okay, and between six months to six years. Now, uh, if you will remember this thing, guys, the thing will be easy for you. Remember, like, they occur in response to fever, right? So, uh, now, uh, many of them, they have family history as well, as you can see, right? And always you will found history of fever okay like either it could be some rash or either it could be some uh, infection which is causing fever but remember one thing like there should be no evidence uh, of CNS infection like encephalitis or uh, meningitis okay or inflammation right uh, why uh, of course, like it means like they they these seizures are due to that thing. Okay. 
Okay, so we divide the thing into simple febrile seizure as well as uh, um, complex febrile seizure. Okay. So whenever they have seizure, we, we classify them either simple or either complex. Uh, simple, by the way, they are also called as typical. Okay. And complex are also called as atypical. Okay. Now, this one is more common one. <clears throat> Around uh, um, up to 70 to 80 percent of the time. You know. This is the one. And this one a complex one is basically around in 20 to 30 percent of the times okay this is the case so we call um, any seizure as simple or typical febrile seizure when all of the following are there uh, like number one the duration is uh, less than 15 minutes okay they are generalized tonic clonic okay uh, no recurrence in 24 hour period and there is there should be no neurological or uh, developmental delay before or after the seizure okay so remember see all of the following should be there all of the following should be there right whereas we classify we uh, like uh, the features for the atypical one again are not so difficult rather very easy so we say that you know uh, that the seizures are atypical when at least one of the following is there so what what is one of the following so see uh, just we i'm going to copy this thing over from here and uh, uh, i will paste over here and i will change the things very little see duration in this one more than 15 minutes uh, so it could uh, you can say in this one it is about generalized so remember just write down here focal okay uh, no recurrence so there is there should be recurrence okay um, recurrence in 24 minutes okay in 24 hours period uh, okay so no neurological development delay before or after so simply uh, change it to neurological or developmental delay or deficit before or after the seizure right so guys see uh, very very easy thing see remember this thing all of the following should be there we call it as simple but if at least one of the following is there we call it as complex or typical okay so this is the thing you know uh, i wanted to talk about the febrile seizures and uh, febrile seizures are the most common one that's why they are the most important one as well and febrile seizures you know uh, uh, most of the time, you know, the children, they are present with the hospital and uh, it's very important that, you know, you must take a quick history in this case. So, uh, simply, how, how to approach these patients is very easy as well. Uh, like, if you will start working in pediatrics, for sure, like, you are going to see a lot of patients of febrile seizures, okay, uh, in reality, because they are too common. So, how to approach the patient with febrile seizure, okay. Um, approach so approach is simple guys take history 
in history, uh, check for any focus of infection, uh, ask about seizures, see it's typical or atypical, ask about if the patient is any, using any medications, ask about trauma history, ask about developmental history, ask about family history. Then go for physical exam. Okay. So a physical exam or physical examination, uh, uh, again like uh, check their level of consciousness, look for the signs of meningitis, look for any neurological deficit, any neurological abnormality, okay, and things. Then we go for laboratory workup, uh, you have to do the septic workup, okay, in this case, so septic workup, I talk about this septic workup many times, so simply, uh, if you're suspecting meningitis, you will go for lumbar puncture, take fluid, you can do a chest x-ray, you can do a blood culture, you can do a urine culture, you can do CBC, okay. So, uh, especially with the child, children are less, so septic workup is very, very, very important, okay. So, if it's typical febrile seizure, okay, we go, don't go for further investigation, no further investigation. Okay, except, except to find the, you can say, focus of infection. Okay, so you are doing investigation just to catch what is causing this fever. Okay, so you are basically doing investigations to catch the current infection. That's it, right? But uh, if it's atypical seizure then follow the guidelines okay to like uh, uh, like uh, to catch the epilepsy cause like you will go for like you will go for uh, <clears throat> CT, MRI, electrolytes, and so on. Okay, so then of course you will go for other investigations, right? So this is like uh, how we do, and simply guys, you know, when, whenever like uh, we found that this is febrile seizure, a typical febrile seizure, we counsel the parents, okay, or the uh, the parents or the guardians for sure, like who bring them because they are very much distressed because their child is fitting in front of them. We always tell them that, you know, febrile seizure doesn't cause any brain damage. There is no brain, there will be no brain damage and they are going to be fine soon and uh, it is not going to leave any permanent damage and uh, it is a common thing, right? Uh, so we always like counsel them, we reassure them about this thing. Uh, this is very, very, very important thing. But we tell them that, you know, there are chances of recurrence, okay? Like whenever they have like fever again, like maybe they will recur again. So, of course, like uh, one of the thing is to uh, stop that on like already going uh, seizure. And the other thing is to treat the infection, treat the temperature. So, of course, we will give them antipyretics, okay? Uh, IV fluids if they become dehydrated, okay? Uh, and uh, um, rectal or injection of uh, drugs like lorazepam okay can be given especially when the fitting fitting is not stopping and treat the underlying cause okay or treat the infection of course so that you know there should be no no fever and then we tell them that okay you know next time don't like if the fever is developing give them paracetamol or whatever so uh, this is how we treat that okay so <clears throat> of course like the antipyretics you know they take some time to act so of course like we should do something to stop that seizure so uh, especially when the you know the, the the episode is becoming too long so rectal dizepam or lorazepam can be given simply 
or even buccal midazolam can also be are also available but you know like diazepam or uh, in 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 pakistan for example you know in government hospitals we they don't have like rectal ones so they go for injection of diazepam simply straight away okay so like when you are working in pakistan so baby like especially in small hospitals like you will found injections mostly that's it they they just give injections because they don't have this rectal diazepam available over there so uh, this is how how they treat uh, uh, what you can say the episodes of uh, febrile seizures okay rest is like all reassurance and tell them that you know they are not going, it is not going to cause any more trouble so guys like there is a lot of neurological condition of course we cannot talk about all about them but the good thing you have done neurology or you have the available list of neurology so remember stroke can occur in children uh, remember myasthenia gravis can occur in children uh, so all of them you know you have already done so of course they 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 they, they will remain same so when you have done that so of course the thing remains same okay yes i i want to talk about neurocutaneous syndromes now i will not go into much detail uh, rather i will keep it rather much simple so neurocutaneous means what in which the neurology and the skin is involved just one photograph i will put in front of you okay now if you will see this photograph these are basically uh what you can say three different neurocutaneous syndromes which can be present in children okay uh so you can see over here for example neurofibromatosis tuberous sclerosis and struge weber syndrome so of course like neurocutaneous means like the neurological system or the nervous system and the skin are involved and these syndromes they arise as due to abnormalities when they are developing okay now first of all i would like to talk about this one neurofibromatosis neurofibromatosis which is also called as von recklinghausen disease von recklinghausen disease okay this one neurofibromatosis have two types neurofibromatosis type 1 and type 2 okay type 1 is autosomal dominant and type 2 is also autosomal dominant but type 1 nf type 1 or nf1 50% of the time it is due to a random mutation or a new mutation okay if you will ask me which one is important i will ask tell you neurofibromatosis type 1 is important because it is more common than neurofibromatosis type 2 okay so if you will count neurofibromatosis how much is there how much alphabets are there letters are there 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 so there are 17 letters in neurofibromatosis so remember guys that the mutation is on gene 17 so on gene 17 there is a protein called as neuro fibromin easy to remember neurofibromatosis has 17 letters so nf1 is caused by when there is mutation on the chromosome number 17 okay there is a protein called as what neurofibromin that one is mutated so these are the patients who present with learning disorders abnormal speech development and seizures are also common how we diagnose i will tell you here show you here okay 
So, uh, by the way, I will save this image. I will save it rather and put it in the slide, okay? To make available for you guys, simply Okay, see, this is the criteria. Six or more than six cafe or lay spots. Okay, six or more than six cafe or lay spots. Greater than five millimeter in pre-pubertal individual, greater than 1.5 centimeter or 15 millimeter in post-pubertal individuals. What are these cafe or lay spots? See, you can see over here. You can see over here. Okay, on the back there will be. So you can say they are coffee colored or the diagnosis of neurofibromatosis requires at least two of the seven, two out of these seven. So see you either you can got this one like this one, two or more neurofibromas of any type of or one plexiform neurofibroma, axillary or inguinal freckling two or more leash nodules. Now, what are leash nodules? I will show you over here. Again, I will take the help of Bing. Leash nodules. So see, you can see, these are the leash nodules. Okay. This is the leash nodule. Optic glioma, of course, need imaging. Bone lesion with sphenoid Dysplasias need imaging. A first degree relative, parent, sibling, or offspring that meets this criteria. We need two out of these seven. This is how we diagnose neurofibromatosis type one. Neurofibromatosis type two, the incidence is very, very, very less than neurofibromatosis type one. Okay. But they have more tumors like bilateral vestibular schwannomas okay and uh, by the way i'll show you that thing as well nf2 criteria okay you can see over here this is the diagnostic criteria for neurofibromatosis one okay Yes, this one is the neurofibromatosis type 2 criteria. So, you can see like bilateral vestibular schwannomas, first degree relative with NF2, unilateral vestibular schwannoma with this thing and multiple meningiomas with unilateral vestibular schwannomas or any two other NF2 like schwannoma, glioma, neurofibroma or cataracts, right? So simply guys, see, they have many neurological as well as skin manifestations. That's why we, we call it as neurocutaneous syndrome. Of course, like any patient who have this thing, we keep on uh, checking them time by time, either they are developing any kind of tumors, okay, all things like this. So uh, you can see like... Uh, these cutaneous features, they are more evident after puberty, okay. So, neurofibromas of these tumors, they can occur in any peripheral nerve, in cranial nerves, in, inside the brain and all this stuff. So, or, so of course, like we have to do surgeries and stuff like this. Tuberous sclerosis, which you can see over here, a female. So, again, this is an inherited disorder. But many of the time it is a new mutation as well. And the cutaneous manifestations are basically um, ash leaf shaped patches. I will show you depigmented ash leaf. Okay. Uh, tuberous sclerosis. Uh, ash leaf spots. See, these are hypopigmented patches, okay, which are seen under the fluorescent light, okay. Also, they have shangreen patches, 
shun green patch. See, this is a shun green patch. 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 I can show you from close shun green patch. So see, this is a rough type of skin. Okay, rough type of skin. Mostly, it's on the lumbar spine. Plus, what they have is. Uh, um, adenoma sebaceum so they have adenoma sebaceum it is a butterfly distribution rash you can see over here see a butterfly distribution okay this one is showing you from the side but I will show you from front so see it's a butterfly distribution okay butterfly distribution rash and it also involves the bridge of the nose okay so this one occurred like when after the age of three and now like these are the skin manifestations so see i show you three things ash leaf uh, one of the is you know this one adenoma sebaceum second one is uh sorry i think uh, okay second one is this shangreen patch the third one is hypopigmented uh, you can say ash leaf okay ash leaf this hypopigmented ash leaf shaped patches okay what are the neurological manifestations in this one like they have infantile spasms they have present with epilepsy they present with intellectual impairment okay so these children they have learning difficulties now many of the times you know uh, they develop fibromas beneath the nails okay as well as you know uh, they are they, it is also associated with uh, you can say polycystic kidneys okay so uh, now uh, what we do like uh, they keep on doing CT scans to catch any nodules in the brain or tubers uh, from the second year of life or CT scans or MRIs okay so yeah, like that's what is called as tuberous sclerosis because they have many of the intracranial uh, manifestations as well this one is Struge Weber syndrome so now um, what happens in these patients see you can see like there is a hemangiomatous lesion on his face on her face like so you can say which is also called as port wine stain it is in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve okay in this one so they have like this port wine stain or you can say this hemangiomatous facial lesion in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve and one like of course this is a skin manifestation so what happens like uh, uh, inside the brain or intracranially they have like similar lesions as well okay so we can of course like uh, cash we can do a CT scan for them um, you can say uh, MRI or a CT scan like you can see like this is in the tuber sclerosis see there are different tubers you can see over here over here like uh, whereas in Scrooge Weber syndrome uh, you can see like see different patients have different manifestations right and see when they do MRIs inside they found the lesion inside as well okay so they have they can see the calcifications uh, inside as well so you can say MRI scans Like this one okay so they have like intracranial manifestations as well x-ray okay so like all this manifestation can be seen on x-ray can be seen like at many places so like that that's what they are called as neuro uh, fibro, uh neurocutaneous syndromes okay so that's all guys for neurology rest like all the things all the conditions which are which are adults of course they can occur in pediatrics as well so thank you so much for listening i will see you in next 
and the last lectures for pediatrics.